Hari Om. I am so delighted to see all of you coming and attending the chick camps year after year. Some children, they are professional camp attendees. I am seeing every year. And they are coming from Balbir till now they are coming. Some may, somebody may think, I think they don't have job or no other work. That's why they only attend camps. No, they are very successful and they are attending. That gives us a lot of pride. I don't want to take more time. Um, in Bhagavad Gita, it is told in one sloka where if Bhavan Sri Krishna is there and Arjuna, then surely there will be prosperity and success. Now, here Bhavan Sri Krishna is Acharya Vivekji. He is ready to teach. Actually, from the, from the flight, he must be planning what to tell. And now, you are ready to listen. In this winter, nobody will come, but all of you have come. So, all of you go with a lot of wisdom, and after the camp is over, little differently, we will work. And all of you go very enlightened. May Puja Guddha's blessings be with all of you. Hari Om. And now we ask Acharya Vivekji to say a few words and then lead us into our first discourse. Swamiji was right. I did write a few things down. Hari Om. The first time I came to Chinmay Mission Chicago in the role of, of serving was the summer of 2008, and I went to Yamnotri. And since then, I believe in the last four years, I've been to Chicago over 10 to 12 times in the last three or four years. And today when I was at the airport, I was at the airport for a long time today, I was thinking that I'm really leaving home to go to another home. And I'm not just saying that you're thinking, okay, everywhere you say is home. And it's true, everywhere is home. But there's a level of comfort that one feels, um, at least I feel, coming to Chicago. And it's a joy to uh, experience that. When I was studying, we had many overseas Acharyas, uh, many uh, senior Acharyas conferences, because Guruji was our Acharya, so we had a lot of meetings. And Swami Sabodhananda would often come. He's the uh, Acharya for the Hindi course in Siddhabari. And because I spent seven weeks living with Swamiji, I was always assigned to look after him. And I was waiting for Swamiji to arrive one day, and he came and he got out of his car, and it stopped in front of Guruji's kutya. And I did my pranams, and Swamiji said, is Guruji there? And I said, yes, he's waiting for you. And he says, hold this. And I held his bag, and he goes, I have to put on my makeup. And he just fixed his, his, his angavastra and just pushed his hair back and so on and so forth. And then he looked at me in the eye and said, it's the little things that make a man. And what we're going to do over the next three days is focus on the habits that we have. Because the habits are who we are. And if those habits are healthy, then we live a healthy life. If the habits are not healthy, then we're not living a healthy life. And we're going to do this through select verses of chapter 4. And we'll begin with the shloka that we chanted earlier today. And we'll go from there. And we're running out of time because I was uh, late today because my flight got canceled. But today is a special day for me on a very personal level because I started teaching on January 13th in 2008 at Chinmay Dhara. And uh, it was a Sunday, and I taught half a class of Bajagovindam to the adults, and then half a class to the youth on uh, Bleeding the Truth, a commentary that I wrote on, uh, on Bajagovindam. So it's been exactly four years that I've completed in regards to uh, serving society, serving Chinmay Mission, serving myself, really. And it reminds me of what Guruji would often say about uh, Gurudev. It, there's a, a Hindi saying, and I don't know the exact words, but essentially, before nobody wanted me, but then you chose me and I became priceless. And I think about the last four years that I've experienced and it's been, even calling it the best is a relative term, it's been a perfect four years. Because in these past four years, all I do is spend time with masters, like Swamiji, like Guruji, with all of you. What else does one want out of life than that? And that's because someone chose me and I became priceless. So today is a special day for me and I'm happy to be here to share that with all of you. 
At the Masamadi camp this past summer, Guruji met with the Balavihar students, all 250 of them, in the basement while all of the young adults and adults were upstairs getting ready for the discourse. And when he came down, he sat on the platform and he told all of the Balavihar students a story. And here's how the story goes. There was a group of monkeys that would climb over to the neighbors, to the farmer's uh, field, and they would steal mangoes. They would throw rocks and knock those mangoes down. They would shake the trees. They would be in the trees, and they would steal these mangoes and eat them. But as this was happening, naturally the farmers wanted those mangoes, so they would take rocks and throw them at the monkeys. And those monkeys would always be hurt and come back, and they would complain about being hurt and the farmer, but then they'd go back. And they'd go for those mangoes again. And this continued for a long time. And so one day, one of the monkeys said, why don't we have our own mango tree? Then we don't have to bear all of the abuse from this farmer, and we can have all the mangoes we want. So everyone agreed, this is a good idea. But they needed a seed. So one brave monkey says, I'll go and I'll go get that seed. So he goes over to the farmer's field and he takes one of those mangoes, but the farmer's there and he's throwing rocks at him and he gets hit, but he comes back to the group of monkeys and they have that seed and they dig a hole and they put the seed in the hole and they cover it up. And all the monkeys are just standing around looking at that patched up hole. One hour passes, two hours pass. Then one monkey all of a sudden digs up the hole and says, where's the tree? i sorry, where's the, yeah, where's the tree? Where are the mangoes? But it's just a seed. So another monkey hits him in the head and says, it takes longer than that. So they cover it up again. One hour pass, two hours pass, three hours pass. Then that same monkey digs up the hole and just a seed. When Guruji was narrating a story, he essentially was telling those Balavir students, don't be monkeys. <laughs> be patient. And as he was narrating this, I couldn't help but think about the dozens, hundreds, thousands, millions of people around us, including us, that believe we will be happy like that that we'll live the way that we are living right now, but in a moment's time, that we will be happy. I think about our parents that have been listening to discourses five years, 10 years, 25 years, 30 years, yet the same anger problems, the same uncontrolled desire. I always glance at the registration list for each of these retreats, and I always see certain names at all of these retreats. And that makes me very happy that us chicks are committed to coming to these retreats. But two other observations stem from that observation. Number one, we need to change the vision of these retreats to bring in more people who are not exposed to chick. This is a forum to attract people to come to the study groups. So for all, all of the organizers that are listening to this, this is the forum to bring in new people to Chick. Number two, when we come to these retreats, are we, are, do we have the same mentality as those monkeys do? Or are we changing after these retreats? The message that comes out of these retreats, despite how many retreats we go to, despite how much we're exposed to this knowledge, unfortunately gets second priority. And we all know that. We know that school comes first, health comes first, socializing comes first, traveling comes first, everything comes first. But have we really understood the message from these retreats then? from these scriptures. Since when is happiness the second priority? It doesn't really make any sense. 
just like we all laughed at those monkeys, right? It doesn't make sense what they're doing. So what is the problem? Is the problem the message that comes out of the retreats, the discussions, the scriptures? That's not the problem. In Houston, over Thanksgiving weekend, we had a retreat, and we did a debate, a dharmic debate, and the theme was, can Vedanta be lived? And we had our prosecution, our defendants, the jury, the judges, and everyone shared their ideas on it. And after the ideas were shared, then I offered the last point of thought, and that was, Vedanta can be lived, because there are the stories, there are the experiences of so many people that have been transformed by this knowledge. And a month later, I went to London, and I uh, met with our chicks there too. And their number one selling point on why people should come to the discussions is that everyone who's come to those discussions is more efficient and effective at their jobs, in their relationships, in their health, in living. So the problem is not the message. And if the problem is not the message, then the problem must be the vessel where this message is being placed. And if you look at it in a picture format, if I have a cup here and it's lined with salt or it's lined with, um, what's a not so good Indian flavor? Like hajmola. Do you all know what a hajmola is? <laughs> Imagine it was lined with <laughs> hajmola. Anything you put in there would taste salty. Anything you put in there would taste like hajmola. So the same thing with us. The message comes, but the vessel where the message is going is not clean enough, is not pure enough for us to make happiness a priority. I've been to so many chicker treats the last four years, last three years, and I think to myself, what else am I supposed to say for myself or for everyone else to make happiness a priority, the priority? And I'm sharing this not because people aren't seeking happiness. Everyone is seeking happiness. But are we seeking happiness in an efficient and effective manner? This weekend, we are going to focus on antakarana shuddhi. In English, purity of mind. That is what the next four discourses are going to focus on, purity of mind. The preparation in making the mind pure requires effort. It requires action. Whether it's japa, whether it's uh, mananam, whether it's puja, whether it's seva. And when that's done well, the process of understanding knowledge is effortless. We often hear, knowledge is not an action. Correct, it's not an action. But to understand knowledge, actions are required. You remember last winter when we studied mind and meditation? Three chapters on preparation, one chapter on process. Same goes. We need to prepare ourselves. And we need to do this all the time. One retreat, two retreats, even if you go to all 12 retreats this year, that's still not enough. It has to be done every day, every moment. Hence the title, Holistic Habits. Eating, sleeping, walking, driving, talking, fighting, studying, everything has to be infused with this holistic vision of preparing the mind so I can understand this knowledge, so I can be happy. Holistic habits. We are going to do this through a series of potent shlokas from chapter four, shlokas that we need to study, we need to understand, we need to live, especially because Srimad Bhagavad Gita is our biography. And before I get into that, we all at a satsang, all of the people who came on the Chinmaya Inspiration Yatra, so I'll, I'll tweak it a little bit more. When we were at the Global Chick Camp this year, they've had four Global Chick Camps. The first three, I think one or two, 
of our chicks from the West came. This year we had 26 chicks from North America that came. And Swami Srupananda was speaking, and he would often make a remark um, about how all of the people that didn't study at CIRS missed out. He goes, I want, we have this camp here because you all never came to this school. So now the next four discourses, the comment I'm going to make is, I'm going to talk about the Yatra a lot, and I'm going to say, for all of you who didn't sign up, this is what you missed out on. So during this uh, Chinmay Inspiration Yatra, in Velianad, we went to meet Atmaji, who was Guruji's batchmate. And we had a Q&A with Guruji's batchmate. And essentially, he was telling us stories about Gurudev. And I remember the one part where Gurudev brought out the BMI chart, and he pointed at the audience and said, this is your horoscope. <laughs> this is who you are. <laughs> so in the same way, Bhagavad Gita is our biography. And we start off in chapter one where Arjuna faces the world with such confidence, but such false confidence. Because as soon as a challenge rises beyond his confidence, fear, sorrow, delusion. And it's no different than what we face. When our significant other is no longer our significant other, fear, how am I gonna be by myself? Sorrow, I can't live without this person. Delusion, I, can't, I stop eating, I stop going to school. Job, applying for residency, whatever it is. The same goes. Then chapter two comes along and Lord Krishna says, the wise person doesn't grieve, period. He says neither for the living nor the dead, but the point is they don't grieve, that they are happy. And a huge chapter focusing on this. And does Arjuna get any of it? He likes what he hears, but doesn't get it. So comes chapter three. Arjuna, the only way you'll understand what I just taught you is if you start acting with the attitude of it being karma yoga. In other words, prepare yourself. Prepare yourself to understand what I just taught you. Then comes chapter four, which takes that karma yoga, which is a very inspiring message and gives definitive ways to actually live this. So beautiful this chapter is. And then chapter five goes on to say, if one lives like that, they will let go of their ego, which then comes into chapter six, which is meditation. And it all started with chapter three. Get inspired, do it all the time, let go of the ego, meditate and be realized. This is our bi biography, but we have to move past chapter one. And if we don't, we'll be like Arjuna. He dropped his bow, he can't speak, his hair is on, body's on fire. It says, I'm just not going to do anything. This chapter is especially important to everyone in this room because we have a strong preconceived notion that we can't live a spiritual life, that we can't live a divine life. How many times do people, do you come to me and say, but I can't do it right now. I'm too busy. Work's in the way. Family's in the way. I'm going to have a child. Blah, 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 blah. This chapter says enough of the excuses. Live it. And beautifully, this chapter is our Puja Guruji's favorite chapter. And he never told us why while we studied in the course. I only found out afterwards by Swami Shantananda, who said this is Guruji's favorite chapter because this is the first chapter he heard Gurudev teach. It is a very practical chapter, and we will begin our study of chapter 4 with Shloka 24. A famous shloka, which we read about, which we hear, which we chant, and from this evening onwards, I don't want anyone in this room to ever forget. Every meal that's eaten, say it out loud or say it in your mind, but chant this shloka. I'll chant each quarter, each pada. You please repeat. It's on page 51, shloka 24. And then afterwards, we'll chant together. Brahma Panam Brahma Havihi. 
ब्रह्मा ब्रह्म नाहुत ब्रह्म तेन गंतव्य ब्रह्म कर्म सदीनागेदर ब्रह्मापनम ब्रह्म हवि This is the first of the many yagnas that Lord Krishna teaches Arjuna about. Yagna means sacrifice. And every sacrifice has two perspectives from which to look at it. Either what is offered or where it is offered. For example, jnana yagna, which we often hear So jnana yagna either the jnana is what is offered or jnana is where it is offered. And don't get lost in this. I'll highlight what is offered or where it is offered. And every sacrifice has four aspects to it. These four aspects are the individual, the materials, the fire, and the power or deity or result. whatever term you like again the individual the material the fire and the the result and in this shloka what lord krishna is telling arjuna is the individual is brahman the material is brahman the fire is brahman and the result is also brahman and for those who watched the uh, youtube clip from our uh, game of life retreat that houston put together I think it's Ved or Gaurav or someone who's saying the 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 offering is fire the fire is sorry the offering is brahman the fire is brahman it's very uh, insightfully shared Here Lord Krishna is saying all of this is brahman brahman one of the most popular words in Vedanta yet probably the least understood word in Vedanta as well Who is brahman What is Brahman? Where is Brahman? Why Brahman? How Brahman? Brahman comes from the root. Anyone know where the root is? We've studied this so many times. So many times we've studied this. Comes from the root brahat. Brahat means big. And whenever we hear big, we often think about big cloud, big plane, big person, big team, big paycheck, big. But it's always qualified. But brahat, there is no qualification. It is just big. And if big has no limits, we can also call it infinite. So brahat is the root or the base from which the word brahman comes and brahman means infinite now whenever we think of infinity mathematically we think of a huge number that keeps on growing and every other number positive or negative falls into infinity fine scientifically whenever we think of infinity we think of space as such that the universe is infinite even though the universe is not infinite everything is included in the universe So mathematically, yeah, we get it. Scientifically, yeah, we get it. What about philosophically? How come there's separate rules to infinity when it comes to it infinitude? Because if Brahman is infinite, then guess who else is Brahman? You and me. And that chair and that wall and the curtain and everything is infinite. So when Lord Krishna says the individual the material the fire the result all of it is brahman he's not just saying it poetically it is literal it is poetic it is philosophical it is mathematical it is scientific it is everything everything is brahman when we don't understand this we know what maya is 
Maya is that which makes the impossible possible. If you and I are infinite, how come we don't experience it? How come we don't believe it? How come we don't live that? That's Maya. And there's times, and I know we've all experienced this, when we catch Maya and we laugh at ourselves in the way that we've lived or the way we think or speak, that we think that we're fit, uh, finite and separate from each other. And whenever that happens, there's such a sense of joy, but then it goes away because Maya pulls us back again. And it's almost like Neo who notices everything is colored in green and it makes him think. And when he finally escapes from that greenness, he's free. We have to let go of Maya, and it's, it's almost like in the movie Peaceful Warrior where he's holding on to his ego, and he learns he has to let go. And when he lets go, when he lets, lets go of his ego, he is free. He understands who he was, is, and will be. When something is beyond our reach, what do we do then? When we go up to junk a basketball but it's beyond our reach, what do we do? We put a chair there or a trampoline and we step on that to practice dunking. You're all thinking we bring the net down, but that won't, example won't fit. So, <laughs> so we, we, we put a chair there or a trampoline and we make that reachable. In the same way, when we don't understand an idea in philosophy, in Vedanta, when it's beyond our reach, make it reachable. And I want us to remember this through this whole retreat and then after this retreat too. Make this reachable. Do it with our day-to-day -day affairs. And when I was thinking about holistic habits, I was thinking, what else, again, what else can I share with everyone? I've already given ideas on how to sleep earlier. Every month, sleep five minutes earlier, wake up five minutes earlier. I've already talked about Gita, read two shlokas a day. I've already talked about weight loss. Exercise half an hour a day. Make it reachable. And if we do that with everything in our life, we will reach it then. Time management, stress management, relationship management. It's simply about making that which is not reachable today, reachable tomorrow. So now bringing it back to what Lord Krishna is teaching here. In our scriptures, we call that which helps us reach the unreachable a lakshana. A lakshana means an indicator. And for those who listen to the podcasts that I attach with the Ivajara, at the end of each podcast, I give one lakshana. One way to live what was shared in that podcast. Traditionally, in our scriptures, the lakshana is, if you can't see that um, motion detector back there, I will say, look at me. Then I'll say, look at my arm. Look to the end of my arm, look to the end of my index finger, and then look beyond. So I become a lakshana for the motion detector back there. Now what is the lakshana for Brahman? How about energy? What if we, instead of calling it Brahman, call it energy? Does it make more sense then? Energy is not created. Energy is not destroyed. Everything is just energy, right? Our bodies are energy. This is energy. I'm speaking energy. The curtain is energy. Everything is energy. So I've made that idea which is not reachable, I've made it reachable now. And so what Lord Krishna is saying is that energy is offering energy into energy for the sake of energy. Bhagavan Adi Shankaracharya says the same thing, but he calls it gunas. He says the gunas are interacting with gunas. 
Now let's change it from energy into existence. Existence is offering existence into existence for existence. Everything is just existence. Now this is what Ramana Maharishi teaches in Saddarshanam. Just see the existence. It is everywhere. All there is is existence. If we can recognize that Brahman is offering Brahman in Brahman for Brahman in every action, again, studying, eating, fighting, sleeping, brushing your teeth, combing your hair, driving, taking a flight, if one can recognize that, here's what one gets. Infinite, constant, unconditional joy. Because if we're one, who do I get angry at then? How can I be disappointed? Who is there to fight with? All there is is infinite, unconditional, constant joy. Isn't that a priority? In Taitri Upanishad, in the Brahmananda Vali, we calculated the joy of a successful human being who is young, strong, rich, and educated. So all of these factors, their joy, meaning our joy, compared to a drop of the joy of a master or our true nature, is 10 quintillion times more than any joy we've ever experienced. So imagine that you're, imagine we're supermen, superman, superwoman. We have everything. That is one over 10 quintillion of our potential. As we hear this shloka, every intelligent seeker will be asking, why do we chant this before meals? It has nothing to do with food at all. There's no mention of food at all in this shloka. Because if we follow Lord Krishna's train of thought, this is the best picture of a yajna happening. I offer food into the fire of my stomach for the sake of satiating my hunger. So now every time I eat, if I can imagine this, at least three times a day, my mind will go to Brahman. That's why Lord Krishna never talked about food here. It's our rishis. What seers they were to connect this shloka to food. They know that we're going to eat three times a day. Why not make that into a divine habit? Why not think of Brahman every time we eat? And Puja Gurudev, and that's why I want you all to read this commentary as well, says here, this shloka summarizes the entire philosophical content of Vedanta. One shloka. We can end the retreat now. There's nothing, nothing else needs to be said, literally. All the other shlokas I'm going to share are simply a commentary on one shloka. That's why teaching Vedanta is a really challenging subject. Because there's just one message, be happy. And how many times do you have to say it or in how many different times? And still, nobody listens. <laughs> That's all. There's nothing else to say. There's nothing else to do. One meal a day, we should eat in silence. And I don't know what Swati and Monica have planned, but I'd like for that to be lunch tomorrow and the Sunday, to be eaten in silence. And if there's a problem with that, then we'll change one of whatever meal it is. But tomorrow we'll eat one meal in silence, the day after as well. And with every bite, think about Brahman, 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 Brahman. We start here, one meal, two meals. Monday we'll do it too. If I do it on Monday, I'll probably do it on Tuesday. And at least for 15 minutes of my day, I will think about Brahman. And maybe the next month it'll be 16 minutes, 17 minutes. 
and there'll be a time when it's 1,440 minutes. That's the day we'll get realized. And then what will we have? Infinite, constant, unconditional joy. Ten quillion times more than what we're experiencing now. Silence, two meals. One tomorrow, one on Sunday. But start every meal that one eats. Even if one's at the movie theater and you're about to take a piece of popcorn, just chant it in your head. When there's large groups of people, then chant it together. Right? It's fun. Without making a scene, it's fun. Um, <laughs> but even if it is a scene, who cares? I found that, uh, and it's probably not good, but after four years of, of serving in this capacity, that I'm less concerned with what people th say or think or even care about me. Even like when we finished our yatra, then I wanted everyone to join the Vedanta course. I wanted to shave your head, have a shika, only wear white. You know, who cares? Get realized. And I'm sure nobody's parents liked that. But I don't care. Because really, I'm simply a, a catalyst for someone to seek happiness completely. How can someone be mad at that? So in the same way, like I said, if you're at a restaurant, say it out loud. Who cares? You're remembering Brahman. Brahman will protect you from Brahman. <laughs> <laughs> be free. Be fearless. There's no point otherwise. Moderation will get no, and, and no one anywhere. You don't moderate happiness. Happiness, anti up, all in. They're the only people that are happy. If we think about moderation towards what? Moderating happiness and sadness? What kind of life is that? Just allowing unhappiness then. With this shloka, we are given a map. And now Bhagavan Sri Krishna simply takes this map and he puts in a variety of life experiences and continues with chapter 4. But the map's been given now. Everything else is details from this map. We're on Shloka 25 on page 54. Devam eva pare yagnam. Yoginaf par yupasate. Brahmagnava pare yagnam. Yagnevopa Juhwati Devam Eva Pare Yagnam Yoginaf Par Yupasate Brahmagnava Pare Yagnam Yagnevopa Juhwati Here Lord Krishna is teaching Deva Yagna. He says that the yogi performs the deva yagna. And whenever we hear these words, yogi, deva, yagna, automatically, <laughs> I was thinking about uh, right now, whenever Homer hears a certain word, then his mind drifts off into that, like monkeys reenacting the civil war. So in the same way, whenever we hear yogis engaged in the deva yagna, I'm sure our mind drifts to Mahabharata or Ramayana these soldiers performing these yagnas that is out of our reach. But a yogi is one engaged in yoga. And what is yoga? Yoga is kaizen. What is kaizen? Betterment. What is betterment? Seeking happiness. So a yogi is one who is trying to better themselves, to be less greedy, to be less, uh, less tardy, to be more happy. And what is a deva? Deva comes from the root div, which means to illuminate. So the devas are those who illuminate. Now for you and I, how is there any illumination in our lives? If you close your eyes, can you see anything? If you plug your ears, do you hear any sound? If you close your mouth, can you taste anything? 
These sense organs are the devas in this yajna. My hands illuminate touch for me. My ears illuminate sound for me. So in this yajna, what Lord Krishna is saying is that what is offered is sense objects. And where this is offered is devas, our sense organs. So imagine that every experience we have through the sense organs is a yajna, is a sacrifice, is a means to developing purity of mind. Every experience. So now we're all thinking, but we do that, but we're not affected by it. How come I don't get purity of mind when I eat or walk or talk or see or hear? This idea of being affected by this yajna comes with bhava, comes with attitude, comes with sentiment, devotion. I'll give you an example of that. When I go to the office uh, where my mother works, she has this plate in her office, and it says, Happy Mother's Day, 1984. And it has a big egg with five, four limbs sticking out, and it's supposed to be my mother. My sister made this for my mother when she was five years old. It is the ugliest plate <laughs> that one has ever seen in their life. Yet, 1984, so now that's six, 26 years later, my mom still has that plate. It's not that she can't buy another plate or, you know, get another plate. But it's the bhava, it's the sentiment, devotion, attitude with which my sister made that plate for my mother. That she still retains that, and she'll probably always keep that. So in the same way, when we have this attitude that all we do is a sacrifice, even seeing the lights that are hitting my eyes, that is a sacrifice, then we start being affected by this yajna, by this sacrifice. So now as we hear this, we're all thinking, perfect. Now I can eat and drink whatever I want. I can hear whatever I want. I can see whatever I want. And if you see Brahman in everything, you can do whatever you want. That's why your scriptures say, the scriptures dare not prescribe how a master lives. Because everything the master says and does becomes the Vedas. They are a walking expression of the scriptures. So if one genuinely experiences Brahman at all moments, one can do everything. Because what is one really eating and drinking and saying then? It's just Brahman. But if one doesn't experience Brahman <laughs> at every moment, then everything we do should be Shastra Anusari. It should be in accordance with the scriptures. What are the scriptures? It's like driving down Kingery and you have those guardrails that prevent you from going on to another lane. That's what the scriptures are. They say you can go in any lane, you can drive at any speed, but stay within these boundaries. Not only for one's own protection, but for the protection of the next person too. That is the role that our scriptures play. And it's interesting, those people who harm themselves and others are the ones who follow scriptures the least because there's no guardrails. We should always ask ourselves, how is our mind being affected by our thoughts, by our words, by our deeds? And if affected in a negative way, that's not a sacrifice then. If affected in a positive way, that is a sacrifice. That sacrifice is taking place. And it reminds me of what Guruji had said um, at the Vedanta course when we were there. That in Kali Yuga, Kali, that negative deity, lives in two places. In gambling houses and in drinking houses. That's where Kali Yuga lives. And as one is hearing this, one is thinking gambling, but all of life is a gamble. 
And of course we would think that, right? We can justify anything. But if one thinks about gambling more intensely, not just at a superficial level, yeah, yeah, it's not my money, etc., etc. Gambling is, I want a result without effort, which is the exact opposite of what Lord Krishna is teaching, correct? That's what gambling is. And what is a drinking house? If our nature is awareness, and alcohol makes me less aware, it's actually making me, pulling me down then. So I want us to just think about why this statement is made. It's not to knock those who gamble or those who drink, but if one thinks about it more sincerely, one recognizes why our scriptures are the way they are and why our scriptures are leading us to joy and why it doesn't make sense when we don't abide or adhere to the message of the scriptures. And so, once a month, actually twice a month, everyone in this room should observe Ekadashi Upavas. Ekadashi means 11. Upavas means sit near or move towards. Ekadashi. Five organs of perception. Those are our sense organs. Five organs of action. Ten. And what is the eleventh organ? The mind. All eleven of these organs should be sitting near or directed towards what? The divine. Twice a month, do this Ekadashi Upavas. That day, we often think, okay, Ekadashi, I shouldn't eat. But it's not just about not eating. The idea is that day I will dedicate all 10 of these organs towards remembering the divine. Because if I do it twice a month, the next month I may do it three times, four times, 10 times, 20 times, 31 times. I will be realized then. And why do I want to be realized? Because I will experience joy 10 quintillion times more than what I've experienced thus far in my life. Twice a month. In the Vedanta course, it's mandatory that they have to do this, where that day, they don't eat. But if it's not about eating, it's also about that day, let's not listen to the radio. That day, let's not watch TV. That day, let's only use email if we have to use email. That's the idea. Where these organs of action, of perception, the mind is directed towards the divine. Twice a month. And now, the other yajna talked about in this shloka is called Brahma yajna. And what Bhagavan Adi Shankaracharya has said here is, Brahma yajna is where the ego is offered into Brahman. And when the ego is offered into Brahman, what happens to the ego? It dies. Everyone in this room is on a suicide mission right now. And that suicide mission is of the ego. <laughs> now some people are scared, right? <laughs> but it would be the same fear that a drop of water would have when looking at the ocean. If that, drop, if that drop's fears are legitimate, it's because the drop doesn't want to be great. The drop doesn't want to reach its potential. The do drop doesn't want to be unconditional. And sometimes, most of the time, we're like that too. Our potential is infinite. What are we scared of? Why aren't we jumping? In London, and Swamiji, Swami Srupananda touched upon this as well, um, the chick coordinator in London, the first day when I arrived in London, him and I had dinner together and we went to see... Uh, I forgot what movie you we went to see. Oh, uh, Ides of March. Good movie. I think it's called Ides of March or Tides of March, whatever it's called. Uh, it's a good movie. And before I got in, we got to the movie, he had said that I'm you, 
but I followed the ordinary path and you followed an extraordinary path. And I said, you are me, but you've reversed your observations. You've taken the extraordinary path, I've taken the ordinary path. Why I'm ordinary is because I've made happiness priority number one. Why you're extraordinary is because you've made happiness priority number two. Only an extraordinary person would be able to do that, to have the courage and the strength to give up happiness for whatever else that he's pursuing, or she. This letting go of the ego has to be ordinary, not extraordinary. As long as it's extraordinary, we'll never let go of limitations. And with this in mind, every day, have set dream time. And I don't mean unconscious dreaming like we do when our eyes are closed and we're sleeping, like in, in bed. I mean, spend five minutes, 10 minutes, just dream about what one can do with their life, how one can contribute in the world, what changes one can make in oneself and the world around them. When I uh, f started doing commercial real estate, my father told me, he said, make sure every day you spend 30 minutes in creative time, where you just drive around or sit in a park and just think about different business projects, different business ventures, et cetera, et cetera. And now I do the same, but not towards business. Now it's ideas like I shared in, um, in uh, CIRS, that my dream is to build an international residential school in North America. Why should only, there be a school only in India? There should be one in North America. Wouldn't it be amazing if we got to study um, both a secular education combined with a sacred education six days a week? That would be glorious. And so every day I think about that, about how to make that happen. Um, we've looked into 250 acres in Niagara Falls. We want to build a retirement community there. We want to shift Chinmay Dara there. In the same way, tomorrow I hope we have some time where people can just dream. What do you want to do with your life? What do you want to be? Where do you want to go? Through such relative exercises and breaking down limits, one starts realizing they can be unlimited. But if I'm so filled with fear, even for at a relative level, how can I develop the fearlessness to seek the truth? So spend time dreaming. How much money you want to make, how many countries you want to travel to, whatever it is. In that expansion, a thousand will turn into a million, will turn into a trillion, will get to infinity one day. Dream. We'll continue with our yagnas tomorrow.